Okay, so good morning. <coughs> so let's continue with uh, Darcy's problem. Yes, in fact, not exactly Darcy, but but Brinkman's encompassing the Darcy limit. This is the important point. Uh, yesterday we analyzed the continuous problem, and now let's move to the finite element approximation. So, which is the finite element approximation that we propose? It's the following. <coughs> so, we have to find the velocity and pressure pair such that this variational equation holds. And this B and L are not the Golurkin bilinear and linear forms of the problem, but the following. So, um, first we have one method, which is uh, what we call algebraic degree scales, which is the one that we already saw in the case of the Stokes problem. Let, let us analyze the method. So, <coughs> the stabilized bilinear form has the Golurkin part, that's the Golurkin part, plus uh, one term that is the, the, the residual of the momentum equation, the first equation multiplied by the adjoint applied to the test functions by a parameter that I have called here tau u, that is what we called uh, the other day uh, tau 1, plus the residual of the second equation multiplied by the adjoint operator applied to the test function multiplied by a parameter tau p. Okay? And if you want to account for boundary terms, you have to add this jump. Okay? So here is the right-hand side. The right-hand side, the blue term corresponds to this one. So the, the divergence of u minus g is the residual of the continuity equation. And all this term minus f is the residual of the momentum equation. So two comments. First, you see that we have here the adjoint operator applied to the test function. Okay, the adjoint operator applied to the test function. What does that mean? It means that here the, well, minus the joint, sorry, minus the joint. So these two terms, the viscous and the porosity term, are uh, self-adjoint. Therefore, there is a minus, minus means a plus here and a, pl and a minus here. Okay, there is a change in sign. What provides pressure stability is gradient of P, gradient of Q. That is what provides pressure stability. And in this case, we do not need anything else. Okay. And I haven't talked much about that because this is uh, something that we do. I told you in the general theory that when you have discontinuous pressures, you have to add the jump of the pressure multiplied by the jump of the pressure test function. We designed a method that uh, is, a, uh, is a, light, a slight variation of that in which you have not the jump of the pressure, but the jump of the stress. Okay? That is the jump of the stress, in, in fact, the pseudo stress because we are working with the Laplacian. And here what appears is the same with a plus sign. This is the, the so-called adjoint of the boundary operator. So if that is the boundary operator, this is the adjoint of the boundary operator. So that is very natural in our framework, and that's a method that we designed uh, about five or six years ago. Okay. So um, what is the advantage that we believe? I mean, it has several advantages. But from the analytical point of view, for example, it's very interesting. But from the conceptual point of view, what is the advantage of this? The advantage of this is that the boundary condition that the exact solution satisfies is the continuity of the stress, not the continuity of the pressure alone. So what has to be continuous between elements is not the pressure, but the stress. Okay. So this is uh, conceptually more interesting. So, so this is a method that, that we devised and fits very, very, very naturally in this framework because if this is the boundary operator, this is the adjoint of the boundary operator. In the same way as if this is the differential operator applied to the unknown, this is the adjoint of the differential operator applied to the unknown. Okay? So this is the first method that uh, we analyzed and we proposed. And this is the expression of the parameters that uh, intervene in these, uh, in these equations. So a very important thing is the following. First, well, this, this, uh, this result is obtained using a Fourier analysis. Uh, that's what I mentioned the other day that we, that we favor. You could obtain something similar using bubbles or using, uh, I don't know what you would obtain using the green function of the problem because it's not known in this case. Um, so uh, using bubbles, you would obtain a, a similar behavior, okay? But you wouldn't know which are the values of the constants. And Another very important thing is that all that, in that Fourier analysis, there, there, appear, there appears a length scale for the pressure and a length scale for the velocity that can be chosen. I will not talk about the details, but that length scale 
precisely defines which is the functional setting that you choose. Which is the functional setting? Either the primal, in the case of, uh, I'm talking about the case of Darcy, either the primal, which is uh, L2 for velocities, H1 for pressures, or the dual, which is H deep for velocities, L2 for pressures. Okay. So that's the important point. Here we have a, a length scale. Of course, I assume that the details, you, you don't follow the details. It's just the idea what I want to, to transmit. Okay. Which is the second method? The second method is that we call um, is what we call orthogonal of Greek scale stabilization. And the idea is that instead of putting the residual, we put the orthogonal component of the residual. Only the orthogonal component of the residual uh, in the in the res in the residual and also in the differential operator. If you put it in the residual, you can put it also in the differential operator. Why? Because if you put the orthogonal component, for example, here the divergence of V can be split into the orthogonal projection plus the projection on the finite element space. But of course, the projection on the finite element space tested again against the orthogonal projection will be zero, okay? Because they are, by definition, orthogonal. So that is what we have. And as you see, in that case, the uh, term of order zero does not appear. Why not? Because the orthogonal projection of a function that already belongs to the finite element space is obviously zero. Okay, so sigma sigma uh, uh, if you take the projection orthogonal to the finite element space of this, this is zero, because uh already belongs to the finite element space. Okay, and the same and the same for this already belongs to the finite element space. So this is the method that you finally have. Okay. And these stabilization parameters are the same as for the algebraic of the scale method. Well, uh, we proved that, that the method is stable and optimally convergent in this norm. Okay, we proved that the method is stable and optimally convergent in this norm. And which is this norm? Well, the first one is that norm. If you remember, this is viscosity times gradient of U H or V H squared plus uh, sigma times vh squared. So this is the graph norm of the Brinkman operator. This is the graph norm of the Brinkman operator. Then, something that gives us control on the divergence of the velocity. And here we have this length scale Lp plus something that gives us control on the L2 norm of the pressure plus something that might give us control on the H1 norm so of, the, of the pressure of you want the L2 norm of the pressure gradient, plus control on the jumps, okay? Good. So this is the error function of the method. Let me see if, if I, if uh, you know, what will be the length scale L, the length scale L, in the case of sigma uh, viscosity equals zero, so in the, in the, in the Darcy case, in the Darcy case, uh, nu equal to zero, what will, do you think will be the length scale L in the case of the dual formulation in which we need to have control on the divergence of the velocity? So L, LP, that characteristic length, can be two things. It can be two things. Either a length scale of the problem, a global length scale of the problem, or the element size. Or the element size. Okay? So in the case in which we want to have control on the divergence of the velocity, that will be what? The element size or the length scale of the problem? We want to have full control on the divergence. Therefore, it will be what? What would happen if that is the element size? If that is the element size, h, when h goes to 0, that's what we are interested in, we would lose that control. That control would be meaningless. This would disappear. Therefore, for the dual form, for the dual form, we will need that L to be the length scale of the problem fixed. Okay. Let's see what will be that L, little L, in the um, uh, when when the viscosity is zero for the Poisson problem. If we want to work with the dual form of the problem, do we want to have control on the gradient of the pressure? The dual form, remember, is H dip L2. H dip for velocities, L2 for pressures. 
So in that case, would we, uh, do we want to have control on the gradient of the pressure? No, we don't. Therefore, what should be L? A characteristic length of the element or a characteristic length of the domain? If we don't want to have control on the gradient of the pressure, that should be what? Look, it's not an easy question, I know. That should be the length and scale of the uh, domain. Why? Because if this is the length and scale of the domain, that goes to zero as h goes to zero. We have h squared gradient of q squared, therefore, we don't have control on the pressure. However, if we are working in the primal form of the problem, in which we need velocities in L2 and pressures in H1, that would be H, because then that control is lost, and that could be H. Therefore, we have H squared over H squared, which is a constant. Okay? And then we have H1 control on the pressures. So which is, which is the message? I understand that the details are difficult to follow, but the message is that playing with the characteristic length scales of the problem that appear in the stabilization parameters, those length scales of the problem that appear in the, in the stabilization parameters, we can switch from one functional setting to the other. That is something uh, very curious. Okay? Uh, that will happen again for Maxwell's problem that we will see later. Okay, so this is the norm of the problem. Okay, this is the norm in which we can prove stability and convergence, and this is the error function. So the details, forget about them. Forget about the expression of this function. The message is that that error function is optimal. Okay, optimal means that the error behaves as the interpolation error. Epsilon here stands for the interpolation error, epsilon zero in L2, epsilon one in H1. So, but again, this is optimal. So forget about the concrete expression. So we proved a stability in that norm, that H norm that is defined here, in the form of an imp subcondition. This is an imp subcondition. That remark is a comparison between the discrete norm and the continuous norm. And we proved optimal convergence. Okay? That we proved that the error is bounded by the error function that, as I said before, is optimal. So this is an optimal result. And also, that happens both for the algebraic security scale. For both methods, we have the same result, okay, under cert certain assumptions on the constant. Okay, if we go back, so to the no, not back. If we consider the particular case of Darcy's problem, what do we have? So we have that's the Brinkman problem, okay. That's the Brinkman problem. Darcy is this equal to zero? That, that is that C, okay? That is that C. In the case of Darcy's problem, uh, first we can see two things. Uh, I mean, how do uh, the previous results uh, particularize? And then in the case of Darcy, it would be interesting also to obtain an L2 estimate for the, for the velocity. So it, uh, several things would be interesting. The first is to obtain that, and the second, Contrary to the Stokes problem, I mean not to the Stokes problem, to the problem with viscosity, it would be interesting to play between the primal and the dual form. Okay? In the case of the Darcy problem, it would be interesting to play between the dual and the primal form. And that's what we did here. That's what we did here. Uh, in the case, uh, the particular case in which the viscosity is zero, this is the expression of the error estimates. Forget about that. The message again is that they are optimal. Okay, they behave in an optimal way. And moreover, we were able to prove estimates in L2. Okay, we were able to prove estimates in L2 through duality arguments. Uh, and the same for this algebraic of the scaling method. Okay, um, this is a, an important table. Of course, you don't have to follow the details, but uh, I'll try to explain the message. So, what is the the message? The message is that first. Changing the length scale from h, the two length scales from h to l. So this is uh, lu, uh, this, this is lp lu. That this is the characteristic length that you choose in your parameters. You can change from these uh, uh, results to these results. So if, if you take a look at these results, here k is the order of uh, velocity interpolation. So h to the power of k plus one is the error in velocity. And L is the error in, uh, in pressure. Okay? So if you look at these results, um, what do you observe? 
you observe that that uh, setting corresponds to the dual form of the Stokes problem and that setting corresponds to the primal form of the Stokes problem. This is because of the error estimates that you get. I don't look at the details, it's just the message. So the message is changing from uh, H to a characteristic length of scale L0, you move from one to the other. And you obtain the error estimates in terms of the, the error in velocity, for example, the error in velocity has one component that comes from the, uh, the interpolation error that comes from the interpolation error of the velocity and that comes from the interpolation error of the pressure. Okay? So it has two components. And uh, likewise for the other setting, that is in the other setting. Okay? In the other setting you have a, a worse interpolation that would be the dual setting. In the dual setting you have a worse interpolation for the no, no, sorry, I said, the other, I said it the other way around. That is the dual setting, and this is the primal setting. Sorry for that. This is the primal one. Okay? So in this case, you have a better interpolation for the pressure, for the velocity. Sorry, this is the error in velocity. The, the, I mean, the curiosity, just a curiosity, is that if you want to use equal order interpolation, this is just a curiosity, a detail, a technical detail, it happens that the characteristic length is neither h nor L0, but a combination of both. Anyway, that's a, Forget about that. Okay, then that's it. We are done. I mean, that's what I wanted to show. Uh, the numerical tests uh, just uh, show that we get the optimal convergence rates in the adequate norm. So if we take if we take uh, L equal, that's a test with an analytical solution, the C flow analytical solution. We uh, that's the pressure, the velocity. That is the pressure, and those are the convergence rates that we obtain. And in parentheses, there are the convergence rates rates predicted by the theory. So everything. Everything agrees. And the interesting thing the here, we have used uh, equal interpolation, P1, P1. And the interesting thing is that uh, this one, you know, this curiosity, if you take the length of scale as uh, this combination, the square root of the product of the uh, global length of scale times the element length of scale, you get the best uh, results. That's uh, what the theory predicts and what, in fact, uh, happens. This really happens. Okay, so we were happy because we were able to reproduce both the, the dual form, the primal form, and something in between that happens to be optimal for the P1P1 element. Okay, for the P1P1 element. Um, okay, that's another convergence table, and that's another solution. So that, that's for Stokes. Okay, for Stokes, we also got it. I mean, everything works. Okay, so that's it. That's what I wanted to say about uh, Darcy. Here, um, the boundary conditions that I will not uh, talk about, as I said yesterday. And then the conclusions, uh, which are uh, summarized here. What we did in this work was, first and the most important thing, the one I have tried to explain in, in, in more detail, is a unified framework for the Stokes and Darcy problem. This is at the continuous level, at the level of uh, partial differential equations. Okay, at the level of partial differential equations. Then two families of stabilized finite element methods. If you remember what I said yesterday, one in which the projection on the, onto the space of, of subscales is the identity applied to the residuals, and the other in which the subscales are orthogonal to the finite element space, okay, the two options. Okay, then uh, that, uh, those methods depend on a length scale. Depending on the expression of that length scale, we uh, can obtain either the primal form of Darcy's problem, the dual form, or something that happens to be optimal with equal interpolation. Something that happens to be optimal with equal interpolation. The order of the velocity equal to the order of the pressures. And that is it. We haven't seen that method to prescribe essential boundary conditions. Okay? Well, that's, those were the papers that we wrote on the subject. Okay, so that's about Darcy. Okay, that is about Darcy. So, what have we seen? We have seen uh, how to apply those stabilized finite element methods based on the variational multiscale framework to their cis problem. Let's move to another problem. And um, here I will uh, describe uh, another talk that I gave also uh, already five years ago um, about uh, magnetohydrodynamics. Okay? And I think uh, that will, I will try to emphasize uh, the interest of using stabilized formulations, not, oil, not only to avoid in superstable elements, because for the Stokes problem you may, you may say, I mean, 
we could use uh, if superstable elements. Why not? Okay, there are if superstable elements in the literature, so you could, we could use them. Hmm? I will. For for the, the for the Brinkman problem is not that easy to use in superstable elements, and I will show that here in the case of uh, when we also have um, uh, magnetic be magnetic uh, influence magnetic coupling. Okay. So this is a general talk about uh, magnetohydrodynamics. Trying to the objective here was uh, trying to explain which are the the model problems. That, uh, that you need to solve well the ingredients, the, the, what is called here the building blocks, that you need to solve the uh, MHD equations. I will talk about this, about uh, the use of Golurgin versus stabilized finite element approximations. And uh, as I said uh, yesterday, I am not objective here. I definitely favor the use of stabilized finite element formulations, and I will tell you why. From the computational point of view, they are much better, they work better, it, they are easier to code, they're more efficient. So. Uh, then uh, we will uh, briefly see uh, these th three problems. We have already we already know how to deal with the Stokes problem. We will review it. That is new for us. That's Maxwell problem. We will see how to approximate it. And then uh, Darcy's problem that we, it's already known. I have talked about that. And then the coupling that appears in the MHD magnetohydrodynamics problem. Okay. Well, uh, the objective of that talk was uh, where where to present two models in magnetohydrodynamics. I will show which are these models to show some applications. Uh, I mean, the, those are applications that motivated our work in this field. And oops, sorry, uh, to discuss the basic compatibility requirements for their finite element approximation. So what, what do you need to satisfy to approximate that model using finite elements? And to explain our approach to tackle the problem. OK, which are the model problems in magnetohydrodynamics? There are essentially two main model problems okay, that I will explain here more or less. OK, one is the general MHD approximation. This is more or less general. So what, what do you do? Uh, the idea is that you take the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, equations. The terms are written here in black. So you see, those are the terms from the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. You have a certain a vector of body forces, the divergence of u0 constraint. And it turns out that there is a coupling, a body force exerted by the magnetic. When there is a magnetic field in, in the fluid, there is a body force that, that, that acts on that fluid and that has an effect on the motion. Okay. This is a body force given by the magnetic field. In fact, B is not the magnetic field, but the magnetic induction, but everybody calls it magnetic field. Okay? Uh, that's mag the magnetic field should be H. If you know a little bit about electromagnetics, it should be H, but everybody calls B, I mean, properly, probably improperly, the magnetic field. Okay, so that is the so-called Lorentz force. Okay? That is the Lorentz force. It looks like a physical parameter. This is called magnetic permeability. Uh, this is density. And this is the curl of the magnetic field times or cross product the, uh, the magnetic field itself. Okay? This is the, um, this is the uh, Lorentz force, which affects the velocity. In turn, when you start from the, uh, from the uh, Maxwell equations, you can uh, you know, Max equations couple the magnetic field and the electric field. If you have um, take the curl of the equation for the electric field, you get an equation for the uh, magnetic field alone under some assumptions, under the assumption of Gauss law and um, under the uh, uh, assumption of uh, relative. Uh, uh, s small speeds compared to the relativistic speeds and well, several uh, physical assumptions. You get an equation for the magnetic field alone. And that equation contains a term that is the curl of the so-called induced current. What is the induced current? It's easy to understand. The fluid, the fluid as it moves, since the particles of the fluid may be charged, their motion, the motion of these particles, induces a current, an electric current. Okay, I mean, particles that move, because the fluid itself moves. Therefore, the velocity that carries those particles introduces a current that couples the equation for the magnetic field and the equation for the uh, velocity, the Navier-Stokes equations. Okay? So forget for the moment the term in blue. Forget the term in blue. 
So the exact equations are the equations written here in, in black and, and red. So first you have the Navier-Stokes equations affected by the magnetic field because of Lorentz force. And then you have the equation for the magnetic field affected by the veloc velocity because of the induced current. Do you understand the coupling? Do you more understand the model? OK, that's the model. I mean, I haven't explained where does this equation for come from. I haven't explained where does this equation from come from. This comes from continuum mechanics. This comes from electromagnetism, OK, under some assumptions. OK, and now a very important detail, a very important detail. In principle, that variable should not appear, should not appear. Why? If you take the divergence of this equation, if you take the divergence of this equation, the magnetic force, the, this body force, so to speak, is always divergence free. From the physical applications, it's always divergence free. So if you take the curl of these equations, what will happen? Since the curl of B is equal to zero, the, this will be equal to zero, assuming that derivatives commute. That will be identically zero because the divergence of the curl is identically zero, as you know. And that will be identically zero because the divergence of the curl is zero. So that will mean means that we will have the Laplacian of R equal to zero, and R shall, shall be zero. R shall be zero, always. So you don't have to put the R. The R does not, or the gradient of R does not appear never in the equations of electromagnetism. Okay? Why have we put here? Because in physical terms, as soon as you start from a field that is divergence free, so the initial condition for B is a field that has uh, divergence equal to zero, then the divergence will be zero forever. Why? Because we will have time derivative of the divergence of B equal to zero, equal to zero, and therefore the divergence of B will be zero always. So that equation will be automatically satisfied. This is Gauss law in the context of electromagnetism. Okay, so that equation, as soon as you start with divergence of B zero equal to zero, at time t equal to zero, the divergence of B is zero. If you start with a solenoidal uh, uh, magnetic field, the solution will remain solenoidal forever. However, what happens when you do numerics? When you do numerics, what happens is that first, uh, 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 differential operators discretized do not commute. So the divergence of the time derivative is not the time derivative of the divergence. And the divergence of the curl is not exactly zero at the discrete level. Okay? If you take the matrix of the divergence and you multiply it by the matrix of the curl, they are, never, they are not exactly zero necessarily. 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 And therefore, what uh, we do in, in the numerical approximation is to enforce the condition that divergence of B should be zero, even if the initial condition is divergence free. Okay? How do people impose that condition? Through different ways. The most popular are either through, per, through penalization, that's one possibility, or through the introduction of a sort of Lagrange multiplier. So you introduce an, an additional variable, R, which is uh, fictitious. We call it pseudo-magnetic pressure, because the magnetic pressure is something else. We call it pseudo-magnetic uh, pseudo pressure. And that variable, that new variable, allows us to impose the condition divergence of u of b equal to 0. Therefore, at the continuous level, r is equal to 0. But at the discrete level, it's not 0. It's something small that allows us to impose divergence of b equal to 0. So this is a, a, a trick, so to speak, if you want to say, that is used in, in, in MHD very often, okay, in magnetohydrodynamics. Okay. In fact, this is interesting because you could also impose that the divergence of B is equal to something, okay, is equal to G. And then that would be interesting. It's a given that should be equal to the emerging charges. If you have a, a media in which, uh, for example, in, in fusion technology, in, in nuclear fusion and nuclear fission, in both cases, in some cases, it is interesting to introduce, uh, to introduce divergence of B equal to something. Okay, we have had uh, several... Uh, let's say motivations to, that, to do that. One of the problems was, for example, modeling crystal, uh, crystal growth. In that case, uh, what you do is um, you inject uh, uh, um, uh, molten material through this uh, this mold, 
and uh, then you in order to make uh, the flow field as smooth as possible i mean to kill vortices you know the effect of the effect of this uh, force the effect of this force the, the lorentz force is that it usually kills vortices simplifying simplifying it makes the flow much smoother this is the effect of the magnetic field so when people introduce a magnetic field in a in a in a fluid uh, what they uh, do is uh, to make the flow smoother. By the way, uh, in the applications there are essentially two types of, uh, of problems in which this is of interest. One is uh, related to what I w said before, uh, nuclear technology, but there is another one that is very important, which is uh, molten metals and metal forming in general. In molten metals, why is it? Because molten metals are electrically conducting. You know, molten metals have uh, conduct electricity, electricity and, um, and, and therefore, um, the coupling between the Navier-Stokes equations and the uh, uh, Maxwell equations is important. So, in that case, uh, you inject a, uh, a crystal in this mold, uh, you put a magnetic field, and you see what happens. That kill anyway. That's the, that's the. Those are examples of uh, application. In this case, we had also a temperature couple. Okay, this is one of the problems. This is one of the problems in which. Uh, uh, in which um, there is a, that is the full MHD approximation. There is a coupling between the magnetic field and the electric field. There is another problem in, in magnetohydrodynamics, another model, which is the so-called inductionless MHD. In that case, it is assumed that uh, the magnetic field is given, okay, is given. But it causes, that magnetic field that is assumed to be given, causes an unknown current density, J, an unknown current density and an unknown electrical potential phi okay so that uh, there is a, it's a simplified model in which we assume that the electric field is a potential field so e is the gradient of phi so the electric field is the gradient of that potential and then the maxwell force when b is given the maxwell force reduces to this expression j cross uh, uh, b that's the maxwell force in this case and we have to solve the equation for the electric potential, which is coupled to the current density. And uh, in the case of uh, potential uh, electric fields, it can be shown that this is an equation that has to be satisfied. So J is the unknown current, that is an electrical current that appears. Phi is the electric potential. And uh, B, as I said before, is given in this case. But there is a current induced again by the moving particles in the fluid. So the, 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 the particles in the fluid have this velocity b, and as the particles move, we have a current that is given by this expression. So again, what's the problem? The problem is that the Navier-Stokes equations are coupled with the current j through the Lorentz force, and in turn, the current j is coupled to the velocity through the in, uh, induced current. So again, we have a coupling, a coupling, but there is a very important difference. The mathematical structure of this problem is different. So the Navier-Stokes equations are similar. But the mathematical structure of this problem is similar, is different, is very different to the mathematical structure of this problem. Which is the mathematical structure of this problem? If you look only at the, at the black terms. If you look only at the black terms, you have to find j and phi solution of these equations. And th those are what? That's these equations, of course. Those are, those are those easy questions. Well, we have uh, we had a, a big project in in um, in, in fusion, uh, and that uh, the, the, that model was motivated by this project. Okay, I, I will uh, I will skip that. So let's go to the uh, building blocks of the problem. So again, let's recall the first problem. The first problem is uh, the general MHD magnetohydrodynamics approximation. So that is the problem that uh, we have to solve, okay? Coupled velocity, pressure, magnetic field, and magnetic pseudo pressure. The magnetic pseudo pressure. Okay, so which are the building blocks? By building blocks, blocks meaning the problems, the, the model problems, the simplified problems that we need to solve. That we need to solve. We see that in the Navier Stokes equations, uh, the, the, the first simplest problem that we have to be able to solve is the Stokes problem, which are the problems, uh, which are the terms written in red. 
Okay? So, the terms written in red are the Stokes problem. Then we have the convective term, we have the time the derivative, and we have the Lorentz force. But first, you, you put all this on top of the Stokes problem. Okay? And what about the equation for the magnetic field? For the magnetic field, apart from the time derivative, we have the term that is uh, written here in red, and this is the so-called Maxwell problem. Okay, not the Maxwell's equations, but this is called the Maxwell problem. Okay, the Maxwell problem, which is, um, as you see, um, a problem that involves the double curl of B plus gradient of R equal to a right hand side and divergence of B equal to zero. Okay, so in the case of the general MHD approximation, we have Stokes and Maxwell, and in the inductionless approximation, as I said before, we have again Stokes, but then we have Darcy. Okay, so in one case we have to know how to solve Stokes and Maxwell, and in the other case we have to know how to solve Stokes and Darcy. So the three model problems that we have to be able to solve uh, accurately are those written here, which are, as you see, very similar, very similar. So we have to almost similar, but at the end very different, as we will see. So we have to know how to solve the Stokes problem first. That's the first building block. There are more ingredients, but at least this is one. We have to know how to solve Maxwell's problem, and we have to know how to solve Darcy's problem. Okay. So if you look at the expression of these three problems, uh, using the same letter for the unknown in, 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 in the three cases, they have a similar structure, and what here we have minus a physical parameter times the Laplacian. Here we have lambda times the double curl of u. So this is a second order differential operator. This is a second order differential operator. And this is an operator of order 0. So that's just u uh, equal to f. Okay. Is it clear? So those are three problems. We know this one. We have been analyzing this problem in detail. Uh, we have been talking about that, not that much, but uh, we also know a little bit how to approximate this and the two functional settings that this problem admits. And uh, we have to know a little how to solve this problem, which is very interesting from the mathematical point of view. Let me say, if I, let me check one thing. Yes, yeah, I do have it up here. Okay, so those are the problems that we want to analyze. So uh, we can write them in general, in general as follows. We have to introduce a different form for the, this uh, know, magenta or whatever this, uh, this uh, color is. Uh, for the, uh, we have to introduce a different bilinear form depending on whether we have the Stokes problem, the Maxwell problem, or the RC problem. So the bilinear form that we have been calling A for the Stokes problem now can be either this one, which is the one for the Stokes problem, or this one, or this one. <coughs> The first one requires uh, no explanation. We have been talking about that. It's the uh, viscous term for the Stokes problem. The, second, the, the third one, of course, also requires no explanation because we only have a scalar. We have to test this against the velocity test function or velocity or whatever, whatever u is. Okay? In the case of MHD, u is the current j. Okay? u was the current j. So we have um, to test it against the test function v, and that's it. And in the case of Maxwell's problem, uh, we test this against the function v. We integrate over the domain, and we integrate by parts. And we integrate by parts. When we do that, what we get is the cross of uh, the cr uh, the curl of u times the curl of of v. Okay, integrated over the domain and multiplied by by gamma. Okay. Uh, which is the, the essential boundary condition associated to this problem, associated to the Maxwell problem? It's that n cross u should be given, okay? Not u, as in the Stokes problem, not the normal component of u, as for the cis problem, but in fact the tangent component of u, which is n cross u, okay? n cross u is the uh, boundary condition required for the Stokes, uh, excuse me, the Maxwell operator, okay? Okay, <clears throat> which are the spaces in which we have to work? Well, these are determined by requiring that the, that bilinear form has to be continuous. Okay, uh, and also that the term gradient of p multiplied by v duality is uh, well defined on the minimum regularity assumptions. Th th this is the way to determine this, the functional spaces where the solution belongs. Okay, so which are these uh, these spaces? 
for the Stokes problem we know, for the Stokes problem we know, for the Stokes problem we have that the velocity space, the velocity sp uh, the space the, for variable u in the case of the Stokes problem is h1 for the for u, u is the velocity, and it's l2 for the for uh, p and p is the pressure. Okay, l2 modulo constants. We know that. Okay. And the way we write the duality between the gradient of p and b is minus p divergence of b. We know this, and this is in general integral, and this is L2 product. Okay, L2 product. That is known. That is known for the Stokes problem. Any question about that? Okay. For the Darcy's problem, it's also known. For the Darcy's problem, is what we have seen before. In the case of the dual form. Uh, excuse me, the primal form, this Darcy 1, which is the primal form, u belongs to L2 and p belongs to H1. And this is the way we write this duality. Gradient of p, b. This is the primal form of Darcy's problem. And the second is the dual form of Darcy's problem. So u is in H deep, 0, with 0 under the conditions. And um, and p is in L2, and we write the uh, duality between the gradient of p and the test function in this way. So primal form of Darcy's problem and dual form of Darcy's problem. It happens that for Maxwell's problem we have something similar. For Maxwell's problem, we have essentially uh, well maybe I don't even need to do that. Yeah, no, I need to do this. Maxwell's problem is this one, lambda double co of u plus gradient of p equal to f, divergence of u equal to g or to 0, doesn't matter, to, to 0. So clearly, when we test this against uh, a test function v, we integrate that by parts and we get lambda curl of u curl of v. And then we have two options. We have plus, one option is gradient of p tested against b and then when we test against this against uh, against uh, q we integrate by parts so this is one option equal to the right hand side okay this is one option so this this term is this one and this is integrated by parts this one and the other option is to integrate by parts this one so we have p divergence of u plus q divergence of u of q with t divergence of v equal to the right hand side. So in Maxwell's problem, we also have two options. We also have two options. And these are important to understand, by the way. Maxwell's problem has a very important technical detail that uh, depends precisely on the fact that uh, we understand these, these two possibilities. So what will happen in the first case? Well, first of all, we always need, we always need the u to be uh, to have a call a square interval so that the space the space of functions with a square interval call is called h call okay h call is the space of vector functions such that they are a square interval they are in l2 and the call is in l2 okay that's h call so in the first case in that case that is written here we require that the pressure be in h1 because we want this term to be bounded. We want this term, these two terms to be bounded. Okay? So the pressure needs to be in H1. Whereas in the second case, we need, of course, the velocity in a, uh, the U, which is the magnetic field, not the velocity U, in H curl, but also in H dip. Not only the curl, but also, also the divergence have to be in L2. Okay? Not only the curl, but also the divergence have to be in L2. And then the pressure needs to be in L2 alone, okay? O only in L2, no, not alone, but only in L2, okay? Only in L2. So, and then we write the pressure, ter the pseudo pressure term is like that. Okay. Why, in the case of the Stokes problem, we don't have that option of integrating by parts or not? Because in the case of the Stokes problem, we have all derivatives in L2 because the solution belongs to H1. So all derivatives belong to L2. However, in the case of Maxwell problem, we have these two options because here we only need the, the magnetic field in H curl 
and we may decide whether also the divergence is a square integrable or not. So therefore, we may decide whether we increase the regularity of u or not. Okay, at the expense of decreasing the regularity of Q. Understand? So, in the case of, of Stokes form, we have all derivatives in L2. So, that does not make sense to go to two bilinear forms. So, that would imply increasing the regularity of, of Q by no, without any need. Without any need. Do you understand the idea? Good. So, that is the situation. That is the situation. Now, it, the situation is a little bit different in the case of Maxwell and in the case in Darcy, of Darcy, because the, these two functional settings are um, useful. Both are useful and they are different. So, that is the point. They are different. However, for Maxwell, they are the same. So, it is a strange uh, answer what I said. So, in principle, they are different, but at the end, they are the same. Why? So, in principle, they are different principle you have two different functional settings, but when you apply them to solve Maxwell problem, they are the same. Why is it? Because the pressure, we said that the that is not a real pressure, that is what I call a pseudo-magnetic pressure. The solution is p equal to 0. So, the solution, either, even if you look for the solution here, it will always belong to H1. Of course, it is 0. And 0 is 0 everywhere, you know. 0 is, in all spaces is 0. In all spaces, in all functional spaces, 0 is 0. So, even if you look in the pressure in H uh, in, in L2, at the end the solution belongs to H1. And likewise, the divergence of the velocity is going to be 0. So, even if you look for a velocity that is only uh, curl, uh, the, the curl is uh, only the curl is a square integral, at the end the solution is such that the also the divergence is a square integral because it's 0. You know, in the case of in the case of Maxwell's problem, you know, if that were not 0, if, if this w instead of 0 would be g, then p would not be 0 and everything would make sense. Uh, the two functional settings would make sense. But when, when this is equal to 0, at the end, even if you work in one or the other, the solution is going to be the same. Have you understood more or less the argument? Okay. So, which are the working norms that uh, we use in our analysis? The working norms or of our analysis are those written here. So, first, working norm for the Stokes problem. That is the, the one. So, we know that this is the term that is equivalent to the H1 norm, and this is uh, up, uh, with, with a good scaling, with a good scaling, so that units uh, match. This is the, uh, the L2 norm for the pressure. Which is the working norm for Maxwell setting 1? So, uh, velocities in H curl, uh, pressures, uh, velocities, no, magnetic field, magnetic field in H curl, uh, a magnetic pseudo pressure in H1. It's this one. This is the uh, function, the norm, the working norm in um, for Maxwell 1. So we have control on the curl, control on the L2 norm of the velocity, and control on, on velocity, magnetic field, and control on the magnetic pseudo pressure. And in the case of the weak form 1 of the or the setting 1, we also need control on the gradient of the magnetic pseudo pressure. Whereas in the case of Maxwell's problem 2, we don't need control on the gradient of the magnetic pseudo pressure, but we need control on the divergence of the magnetic field. Okay? So this is the working norm in the case of Maxwell 2. And we have seen this in the case of uh, Darcy. For the primal form, this is the norm. So, velocities in L2, pressures in H1, and this is the um, norm in the dual form, velocities in H deep, pressures in L2. In this case, V is not the velocity, but the uh, uh, current, and Q is not the pressure, but the electric potential. Okay, that's the function of that. Okay, a comment. I think this... Uh, uh, should convince, uh, I would say, everybody uh, of the importance of using uh, if super stable, uh, of using stabilized formulations. So now, imagine that you want to solve these three problems, these three problems using if sub stable elements. Okay, so the there is exactly the same if sub condition, the same if sub condition, the expression of the if sub condition is the same for the th the three problems. But the spaces where you work for the velocity are different. So we have uh, 
the same in subcondition, the same expression of the in subcondition, but the working spaces are different. Which is this expression? So we have to satisfy that the infimum for all q in q different from zero of the sub for all v in v different from zero of, of in, in all cases we have let me call it b of q b divided by the norm of q in q and the norm of b in b is bounded from below by a constant beta so this is the inf subcondition that you need to satisfy right but since the spaces are different q changes from one problem to the other and v changes from one problem to the other then the elements the pairs velocity pressure that satisfy that condition are different which are the pairs that satisfy that condition here you have examples examples so which is which is the simplest pair that we have seen the simplest pair that satisfies the inf subcondition in the case of the Stokes problem. I have drawn here the velocity nodes uh, with uh, black little uh, circles and the pressure nodes with uh, uh, bigger red circles. So we have the uh, corners of the triangle and the internal bubble as degrees of freedom for the velocity you see we interpolate the velocity both velocity components this is a 2d element of course in 3d the same thing applies we apply the two velocity components we interpolate the two velocity components at the nodes at the vertices of the triangle also at the central bubble and we interpolate the pressure only at the vertices of the triangle this uh, do you remember how did we call this element the mini element that was the mini element okay or Arnold Bredzi, um, uh, Marini, no, what was it? Ar Arnold Bredzi for 10, sorry. Arnold Bredzi for 10. Okay, this is the element that is in superstable for the stocks. But when you go to Maxwell, that's not, that element doesn't work for Maxwell. It's not in superstable for Maxwell. The element that works for Maxwell is this one. And look at this, look at this element. In this element, uh, this is for, uh, for the first variational form of Maxwell's problem. So, a, uh, uh, magnetic field in H curl and pressures in H1. For, for that element, what you need to do is to interpolate the pressure as we did before. So, with uh, linear interpolation at the ver uh, from the nodal values at the vertices. But the velocity has to interpolate it at the center of the edges and only the tangent component. Only the tangent component. It is the simplest of uh, the uh, family of the so-called Nedelex elements. Okay, Nedelex elements. So you have to interpolate the tangent velocity at the center of the edges and the velocity as here in H1. So very different. What about that C? If you use the primal form, ah, by the way, if you use the, the second functional setting for the Maxwell problem, you can use the same interpolation as this. So because here you need in the second setting you need the velocity in h curl and h deep and the pressure only in h deep so if you need the velocity both in h curl and h deep then uh, you have to, to, to you can use the, that interpolation so the same as here what about that c if you use the primal form the primal form this is the simplest element that is in superstable <laughs> but that element you could you could imagine that because what is this element we have uh, pressures that are linear and continuous because they have to belong to H1 in the primal form pressures that are uh, linear and continuous and velocities that are piecewise constant only one element only one value per, per element only one value per element so piecewise constant but that we know if we approximate we know that the velocities in this case are the the fluxes of P imagine a heat problem so, if we have a linear temperature, for example, the flux would be piecewise constant. Okay, so this is an element that is inf superstable, inf superstable for the primal form. But in fact, what is interesting is not the primal form, but the dual form. That is the dual form of Darcy's problem. And in the dual form of Darcy's problem, if you want to satisfy that inf subcondition, it turns out 
that the interpolation that you require, the simplest one is this one. So piecewise constant pressures, pressures are constant over the element, just piecewise constant pressures, and linear velocities, but interpolating only from the normal components on the edges, only from the normal components of the edges. You see, very different. The three elements, for example, this one, this one, and this one, which are the elements of interest, that's Stokes, that's Maxwell for the first functional setting, and that's du uh, Darcy for the second, for the dual f uh, functional setting, are very different. Okay, this one is called, as I said before, Nedelec's element, the simplest one, and this one is called cruzier raviers element, the simplest one. Okay, this is the simplest cruzier raviers element. Okay, so now the point is, what happens if you change problem? Do you have to change the element in the code? Imagine you have a combination. For example, we, we saw uh, Brinkman's problem. Look at Brinkman's problem, which is written here with, with this term. So if you have the viscous term alive, if the viscous term is active, you have to use this element. For example, if you want to use in superstable elements, if the viscous term is active, you have to use this element. But if you have regions in which the viscosity goes to zero or is directly zero, that element is not in superstable. This one is not in superstable. So you have to resort to this one. You see? That is so and what how do you do that? It's impossible directly. So you cannot deal with problems that have both physics, uh, Stokes and Darcy at the same time. Okay? So uh, my point is that using uh, I mean satisfying the if sub condition is just that something that you do uh, by chance, so to speak, <laughs> that the general way to proceed is to design methods that allow any interpolation, in particular equal interpolation. Well, that is uh, what is mentioned here. What if you combine problems? So, I mean, for example, maybe combining uh, the, the, the Maxwell operator with the uh, Stokes and the Darcy operator is not very usual, but definitely combining Stokes and Darcy is very common, it's Brinkman's problem. Okay. Uh, and if these problems are coupled, as in, in magnetohydrodynamics, these problems are coupled. So how do you deal with that? You use a different interpolation depending on the problem you are, you are treating. Uh, okay, so the, in, in stabilized formulations, any conforming velocity, UP interpolation is allowed, not only, and we don't have any stability problems in the limit. So in the case of, for example, what is written here, okay? If you want to use in superstable interpolations, that is the interpolation that you have to use for Stokes, the simplest, okay, the simplest, not to talk about higher order, not to talk about higher order, which is a real mess. Uh, this is the simplest Stokes uh, interpolation, this is the simplest Maxwell interpolation, and this is the simplest uh, uh, Darcy's interpolation in the primal case. But if you want to go to stabilized formulations, you can use the same interpolation, so velocity nodes for both pressure and velocity or u and p everywhere well which is uh, which are our methods our methods are based on uh, 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 well this is a repetition of what you know a two scale decomposition of u and p in the variation multi scale framework a proper scaling of the problem i have mentioned that in the case of darcy it is also crucial in the case of maxwell a closed form expression of the subscales based on an approximate fourier analysis that i have in detail because as i said this is something that we do in our group, and then you come up with a modified variational formulation, discrete variational formulation that hopefully works and that we have seen in our problems that works uh, well. The Stokes problem, I don't, say, I, I don't have to say much in the case of the Stokes problem. We know that. That is the bilinear form of the Stokes problem. Um, BS here stands not for stabilized but for Stokes because I have to distinguish between Stokes, Maxwell, and Darcy. And the stabilized form, the stabilized form, is here. This is exactly the same as we have seen before in the case of uh, in the case of uh, Brinkman, in the case of Brinkman, but without the porosity term. Okay, without the porosity term and without jump. Okay, uh, I mentioned here that we ha we favor the introduction of orthogonal projections, as I said before, but here are not introduced for simplicity. And these are the the stabilization parameters in the case of the Stokes. So C, tau u, the, the velocity one, or the momentum one, is h squared over viscosity. And the second one is essentially viscosity. The method is stable and optically con convergent in h1 times n2. Okay? Maxwell's, I haven't talked about that. I will pay some more attention to this. I will pay some more attention to this. And then we will go to the coupling, because that's, we have also seen that. 
What about Maxwell's problem? This is the weak form of Maxwell's problem. Um, for the, this is what is written here. And as I mentioned, we have two ways to write the uh, pressure term, so to speak, the pseudo pressure. If we choose this functional setting, so H curl for the magnetic field, <coughs> sorry, uh, H1 for the magnetic, <coughs> sorry, for the magnetic pseudo pressure, then we write this, uh, the pressure term as gradient of V, so we don't integrate by parts. If we choose uh, the magnetic field in H deep as well, and, and Q only L2, then we integrate by parts. Okay, so those are the two functional settings of Maxwell's problem. Well, a very important fact. So those of you that, are, that um, may be interested in, uh, in electromagnetics, this is the critical point. This is the critical point. Let me see. If omega, the domain, is not convex, is not convex, it turns out that H1 is a proper closed subspace of H curl H dip. What does that mean? So, if this is L2, this is L2, L2 in, in the vector case, okay? In the vector case. Uh, this is H1. H1 in the vector case. This is H1. So, of course, H deep is something like that. H deep, because you require only the divergence, only the divergence to be L2, only the divergence to be L2. And this, for example, could be H curl. That could be H curl. So, you see, maybe I should have used colors anyway. I will use uh, two colors. I like using colors, you know, <laughs> in general. So this is this is H curl, and this is H dip. So what is the situation? The situation is that if omega is not convex, so omega uh, has uh, as, uh, an entrance, if omega is not convex, then it turns out that H curl intersection H deep, what is H curl intersection H deep? So that would be H, the, the, the orange intersection, the yellow, so that would be something like that. Okay. That is curl intersection. H deep. It happened. This is a fact. This is a fact. H curl intersection H deep is a closed proper subspace. So it's contained. H one is a H uh, one is a, a proper closed subspace of H curl intersection H deep. However, however, <laughs> this is a big problem. If U H, if U H the finite element solution belongs to H1, so UH is a piecewise polynomial. So if UH belongs to H1, then it turns out that the gradient of UH can be bounded in terms of the curl and the gradient in, and the divergence. And this is terrible. Why? Because, um, because if we have a piecewise polynomial function, then, if we manage to get to bound the curl and manage to bound the divergence, we will manage to bound the whole gradient. What will happen? It will happen that we, if we work in the functional setting H curl intersection H, H deep, we will be able to bound those two terms and therefore we will bound the gradient. Therefore, our finite element solution will belong to H1. You understand? So that, that only happens for discrete functions, for polynomial functions. So what is the problem? The problem is that the solution to the problem, our exact U, could belong here. You know, to the intersection H curl, H deep, but not in H1. However, 
our finite element solution will be in H1. So our finite element solution will converge to something here. What's the problem? We will never be able to converge to the solution. This is the so-called corner paradox problem, or corner paradox. Okay? When there are corners, or in general, when there are singularities, the solution is outside H1, but the finite element solution necessarily belongs to H1. In general, when the domain is non-convex, we are able to prove that the solution belongs to a stage HR with R greater than one half, but smaller than one. Smaller than one. So that's uh, bad, bad news, okay? Smaller than one. For R equal one, which in this case, this does not hold. Okay, so now there is a wrong conclusion here that is often taken in the literature uh, that you will often see. The conclusion is that once people see that, once people see this, they claim you cannot use con uh, H1 conforming. H1 conforming means continuous finite element spaces to approximate your space. They claim that. They came to the conclusion from this, they say, okay, you cannot use uh, uh, continuous polynomials because if they belong to H1, then uh, they will always belong to H1. This is wrong. Why is this wrong? Look at the two functional settings. I said, I said that the solution at the end, the solution will belong to H dip, will belong to H dip because the divergence will be zero. The divergence will be zero. But where is the problem with this estimate? Who sees that? That would be uh, a very clever answer if somebody tells me what is the problem. I mean, what is the problem with this assumption? What should, what you shouldn't do? What is what you shouldn't do if you look at this? What is you shouldn't do? What is the origin of the problem? If you look at this estimate, you will have problems as soon as what? As soon as you have a bound for the divergence of u. Because the problem can be posed only in h curl times L h1 for the, pre for the pseudo pressure. But the problem is that you don't have to have control on the divergence of u. So your method, your finite element method, has to be uniformly bound. I mean, the solution has to be uniformly bounded uh, for the curl. The curl of the solution has to be uniformly bounded. But you cannot have the divergence uniformly bounded. If you have a method that gives you uniform bounds, uniform means independent of h, uniform bounds, for the uh, for the divergence, you're lost. You're lost. You're killed. You will not be able to solve Maxwell's problem because if you have uniform bounds for the divergence, and of course you want uniform bounds for the curl because in both functional settings you need the curl to be bounded. So if you have a bound for that and a bound for that, and you use piecewise polynomials, you will be in H1. So you will never be uh, be able to get out of this space, never. Even if the solution is outside the space, you will never be able to get out. It's like a jail, you know, you are there and you will not be able to go outside and catch the exact solution. Which is the correct conclusion? Uh, the correct solution is that if the divergence of U is uniformly bounded, H1 conforming finite element spaces cannot approximate our space. But we do not want elements uh, to be uniformly bounded. So our method for uh, our method, uh, our stabilized finite element method for the Maxwell problem, this is the Maxwell problem, is very similar to the one that we mentioned. Uh, very similar to the one we made. with a proper design. The key, the key is to have a proper design again with a characteristic length, a proper design of uh, the stabilization parameters. I will not go into details. Again, we we obtain that through a, a Fourier analysis and. Here, the characteristic length is crucial. Why? It, you can see it from here. You can see why from here. Look at this expression. Look at this expression. If we have, ta if we have tau p, which is order 1, if tau p is order 1, we are lost. Because if tau p is order 1, that is uh, the divergence of u will be bounded. Just taking v equal u, the divergence of u will be bounded. If so, tau tau p cannot be order one. So here it is crucial to take tau p as 
h square over a length square, a characteristic length, and that is what you need to use in the curl formulation. If you use tau p, which is uh, the physical parameter time h square over lambda square, then the, the, the control that you have on the divergence is multiplied by h. So it goes to 0 when h goes to 0, and you don't have a uniform bound for the divergence. So we will be able to switch, ah, and by the way, we, can, we are able to switch from one functional setting to the other, again, like for the assist problem, by a proper scaling of the stabilization parameters in terms of this lecture scale. Well, this is the working norm. You see what I meant? We have control in H uh, curl, control in H1 for the pseudo pressure, and the control on the divergence is multiplied by H, and that saves us. That saves us. That saves us, and um, and then L equal to L zero, which is a, a characteristic length, gives control in um, in uh, H curl times H one. And on the other side, you see, if we take L equal to H, then uh, that gives us control in H curl H deep, because then we have control on the divergence, but we don't have control on the gradient of the pressure, because this is H. Okay. But the interesting functional setting is this one. This is the functional setting that allows us to capture solutions that do not belong to H1. These are called singular solutions. Hmm? Um, the continuous is singular. Okay? It's at the continuous solution when it belongs to HR, uh, but R is smaller than 1, this, this setting, so R it doesn't belong to H1, the solution is said to be singular. Okay? And this is an example. This is an example. Uh, in which this happens. This is a solution, this is a test case. Uh, U is the gradient of this function. R, it's written in, in polar coordinates, so R is the radius. And it turns out that depending on, on N, on that power N, you have uh, solutions that do not belong to H1. For example, for N equals 1, for N equals 1, the solution is in H uh, 2 thirds, 2 thirds minus any epsilon positive. So the solution is not in H1 is in H curl intersection H deep, it's in, in this uh, uh, zone, but not in H1. And that's, the, that's what you get. You know, this is uh, the exact solution. This is what we get in our method. This is what you get using, uh, um, using elements that uh, are continuous, and you take the length scale equal to, equal to uh, H, so this is you think this L equal to H, therefore you have control on the divergence. If you have control on the divergence, you are absolutely lost. You don't capture the solution at all. So this is the situation. You are converging somewhere here. You are converging somewhere here, but the solution is there. So you do not capture it. And if you don't stabilize, you just get a mess. Okay? If you don't stabilize, everything is completely wrong. Okay? So again, exact solution, our solution, the solution in the wrong functional setting in the wrong functional setting. So that's extremely important. So a completely wrong solution. You don't approximate at all the solution, and then the solution without the stabilization. Th this is the, the, uh, the first the x component, and this is the y component, exactly the same conclusions. Absolutely oscillating without the stabilization. Um, P1. So this is a variable or a reality construct of species? No, no, the space is P1. It's linear elements. For both case in both bo for both u and p. So the bases are linear elements. Jo we have used uh, we are talking about the stabilized method. So we, we have used to approximate uh, both uh, both uh, u and p. This okay. This this uh, this this interpolation. We use this everywhere. Linear interpolation for velocity and pressure everywhere. Okay. So that works. Uh, Darcy's problem, I don't have to talk much because we have, in, we, we have been talking about Darcy's problem um, uh, uh, before, so I don't have to talk much. We have the primal form, which is not interesting, as I said, because it is nothing but, um, nothing but the, the mixed form of Poisson's problem. And we have the dual form, which is interesting in many contexts. In particular, it's interesting in inductionless magnetohydrodynamics, as we have seen. This is the bilinear form of the problem, and this is what we have seen, exactly what we have seen. That those are, this is our stabilized finite element formulation. So we add that this is what we have seen with, with, with nu equal to zero. Okay? 
So we had uh, the residual of the momentum equation with the adjoint of the momentum operator applied to the test function, and the same for the continuity equation, and these are the right-hand sides. Okay? Again, this is what we have seen, the, the stabilization parameters that have to scale according to a certain uh, characteristic length. We, depending on whether you choose it, we, we switch from the primal formulation to the dual formulation. Again, that's what is said here. We are able to switch from one functional setting to the other just by a proper scaling of the stabilization parameters. Uh, the numerical analysis is what I have, um, what I have uh, explained a few minutes ago. With L equal to L0, a fixed uh, characteristic length, that gives us uh, the discrete version of the HDPL2 functional setting. The dual, pro the dual problem. With the characteristic length equal to the uh, uh, mesh size, uh, we have the uh, approximation to the primal problem. And then there is this <laughs> curiosity, or whatever you want to call it, if you take that characteristic length that is the square root of h time L0, so a sort of uh, geometric mean of the uh, global length and the local length, this yields a norm that happens to be optimal for equal order interpolations. Okay? That is what we have seen before for the Stokes problem. And then the accuracy, this is, in fact, this is a, this is a very brief uh, summary of the, the other table that uh, I showed before. In the cases of constant uh, velocity linear pressure, which is, um, which is constant velocity linear pressure, is this one. Okay? That is constant velocity linear pressure. That these, these are the estimates that you get. This is the um, linear velocity, linear, but discontinuous, linear velocity constant pressure. This is the cruzier rabiar element. And this is the case of equal interpolation velocity pressure equal to 1. And you see that this method is the one that happens to be optimal, okay? that happens to be the best. Look, in the case of the primal for mixed problem, in the case of the primal mixed problem, you don't get convergence for the divergence of u. Why not? Because you know that in this case, in the primal mixed problem, u, the velocity, belongs only to L2. Okay? So you have convergence for the velocity. Since it is piecewise constant, you have convergence of order h for the velocity, but no convergence for the divergence of the velocity. In the case of the dual problem, in the case of the dual problem, you have convergence for the pressure, which in the pressure now is in L2 only, but no convergence for the gradient of the pressure. Okay? No convergence for the gradient of the pressure. However, with this uh, intermediate case, we, you have optimal convergence in all cases and always the best. So it's, it's, a, it's a curious situation, that one. It's a strange. By the way, we do not have the counterpart at the continuous level of which space. In fact, we started working on that, but we left that because it was too technical and it not, maybe not very important. What we did, this is just a parenthesis, what we did is try to see which is the continuous space in which, uh, to which function singular, well, with minimum regularity, uh, functions in this uh, solution of this problem converge. So it's not H1, uh, it's not H1 uh, L2 or L2 H1. It's not the primal form. It's not the dual form, but it's something in between. You know, it's. Uh, but it was uh, we had some technical problems. Okay, what about MHD? Now you want to look at uh, MHD. Now let's take a new look at MHD, knowing the problems that we have to face. No. This is a problem of interest, so that's not only a toy problem, so that's a problem of interest. So we have to solve the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations in the case of the general MHD approximation coupled with the uh, equation for the magnetic field. And we have seen that built in these equations, we have, in that case, the Stokes problem and the Maxwell problem in red. What? What happens? Go ahead or not. And in the case of, of the inductionless MHD, we have the Stokes problem coupled with the Darcy's problem. Here, remember, J is the current and phi is the electric potential. So now that we know that, and you want to write a code, you want to write a code, 
and you have to interpolate the variables, you have to interpolate u, you have to interpolate p, you have to interpolate b, you have to interpolate r, or you have to interpolate u, p, j, phi, what would you do? So go to your code and start coding the shape functions, the derivatives, loops over the nodes, uh, loop over the integration points, assembly of the matrices. What would you do? Would you really dare to use mixed interpolations? So, in stable interpolations. So, would you use, for example, piecewise linears, continuous for you, with, with a bubble function, and piecewise linears for P, and then piecewise linears for R, but this was linear, but only interpolating, only the interpolating the normal component of R. So that okay, you could do that. But then, what would you do to uh, to program this? So you you should call two sets of, of shape functions, interpolate U with one set, interpolate V with one set. One would require one interpolation order, numerical interpolation. Another, the other would require another interpolation you would have to use the interpolation rule that is able to capture both. You understand? It's a real mess. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you understand. In multiphysics, trying to, to solve, uh, to, 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 to stick to insuperstable approximations is a real mess. That's my point of view. Okay? And if you talk to anybody that makes real calculations, I'm not talking about solving this Stokes problem alone or the Maxwell problem alone without coupling. No, no, no. I mean, I, I agree that if you have only one problem, but <coughs> if you have to go to real problems with all couplings, and not to talk about fluid structure interaction, you could couple that with the structural part as well. Or uh, you, could, you could couple these with the transport of uh, species that in turn interact. Because this is another problem <coughs> that I haven't mentioned in the convection in the first talk, in the first chapter about the convection diffusion reaction. When we have convection diffusion reaction systems, systems, then you also have to meet the IMSUB conditions. You have to satisfy the IMSUB conditions, and they are not trivial in general. That depends on the advection matrices, convection matrices, and diffusion matrices. You understand? So depending on the structure of the coupling, you have to satisfy appropriate IMSUB conditions or not. Okay? So I, my point of view is that that is a mess. Okay? Linearization. This problem has an interesting point about linearization. This one, this this problem, um, has a, a not so nice property, and I would like to make a remark on that. Uh, when you linearize these equations, I mean, you have two options: to solve them in a, in a single shot, boom, and or try to try to solve them step by step, so it's separately. And in fact, it turns out that you cannot solve it step by step. And that's a comment I would like to make. To make. So let's linearize this equation. Uh, of course, the linearization of the Navier-Stokes equation. Here, k is the, super, uh, the, the iteration counter. The superscript k is the iteration counter. So that, that is simple. To linearize the convective term is simple. This is just uh, uh, u k is uh, k minus 1 is the previous uh, iteration of u. And then we solve for the current iteration. So the first point is that you cannot uh, move all that term to the right hand side. You cannot move all the term to the right hand side. OK, that's as it is. But the real bad thing is that in this term, in order to have a stable, the only, that can be proved, uh, it's not uh, difficult, the only stable fixed point method for the general, also, type, also called resistive MHD problem, is this one. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you want to have a fixed order, a fixed uh, point method, you, have to evaluate, you can evaluate that at k minus 1. But the second argument, this one is what has to be evaluated at k minus 1. You have to evaluate it as k. And look at the, look at the uh, induced current. In the induced current, you have to take as unknown the velocity and evaluate at the previous iteration the magnetic field. What does that mean? It means that in the equation for the magnetic velocity, you necessarily have a coupling between the magnetic field and the velocity. 
So you cannot split, you cannot assume that this is uh, known and compute the velocity, f the magnetic field alone. If that could be, look, if that would be k minus 1 and that would be k, that would be great because you would solve for bk and put it here and solve for uk. But you can't, you know. The bad news is that you can't. The method, the iterative method is not stable if you put here k minus 1 k. You have to put k, k minus 1. And therefore, the system has to be solved in a coupled way um, uh, necessarily. In the case of the, in the, case of the um, uh, inductionless approximation, something similar happens. It turns out that the method is unstable. Here, b is given, OK? b is given. But the method is unstable if you evaluate the velocity at k minus 1. So this is a, a Darcy problem, a Darcy problem coupled necessarily with the Navier-Stokes equations, okay? So necessarily you have to put here a u at the previous, uh, at the current uh, iteration, at the current iteration. Okay, uh, so the comment is this one. The problem needs to be solved for all the unknowns in a monolithic way, so you have no choice. Um, well, in the case of uh, MHD, it is possible to use uh, fractional step schemes but uh, I, we will not talk about that. In fact, it's a topic, uh, a very important topic. Uh, we analyzed ways to uncouple the calculation of u and b, and that's uh, uh, what, in fact, I was thinking about that. We did that long ago. We already published later. We published a paper about that uh, uncalculation. Um, and that's a comment, again, about the convenience of using equal interpolation, because uh, uh, only if equal nodal-based interpolation is used, contributions to the global matrix can be computed in a single loop. So you can compute everything in one mesh, OK? Uh, well, that, those are the conclusions. Our stabilized finite formulation uh, allows arbitrary, in particular, equal interpolation from all the unknowns. So sometimes this is also a comment that I would like to stress. People say that the stabilized methods are used for equal interpolation. That's not true. You can use them for any interpolation, and in particular equal. Okay, in particular equal, but they work for any interpolation of the variables. Uh, that uh, favors the ease of implementation. That gives you the possibility to deal with combined problems. Combined problems, meaning, for example, combining Stokes and Darcy in, in Brinkman. Um, uh, and also the possibility to couple different problems uh, with the same interpolation. Uh, the functional setting, the functional setting is extremely important, as we have seen. So, applying the, uh, the adapting the functional setting uh, to the correct one is not just uh, something that you do for fun, but has important mathematical consequences. In the case of uh, in the case of Maxwell problems, for, for example. Uh, they, this has important physical consequences. If we want to deal with singular solutions, we have to be able to change the or, or to go to the functional setting that allows for those uh, singular solutions. Uh, in the case of Darcy's problem, uh, that's what we uh, have seen in the previous uh, session. Uh, the question is, if you want to switch from the primal or, or the dual formulation, depends on whether you prefer we pre you prefer good fluxes or you prefer good primal variables, uh, okay? So that depends on the problem you are dealing with. Maybe you prefer the, in the case of, of, the, of the Maxwell problem, uh, so in the case of, for example, uh, uh, porous media flow, you always prefer good fluxes. But in the case of the Maxwell problem, you may, you may prefer either a good current or a good pot electric potential. So the approximation depends on the functional setting of the problem. So those are the papers we wrote. Okay, so this is the end. That's perfect because uh, that was the third uh, topic that I wanted to touch, which is uh, MHD, magnetohydrodynamics. And then there is only one topic uh, left, uh, which I'll try to shorten, which is waves. So as we agreed yesterday, we will do this this afternoon. Okay, so thank you for your attention.